You're listening to the Regeneration Rising podcast, a podcast from the Kavira Coalition about the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of agrarians in the United States. Each episode will explore what it means to work in regenerative agriculture, how people came to choose this as their livelihood, and why it's important to them and the future. We hope to build a foundation for a strong community of future agrarians and land stewards with a regenerative approach to community, relationships, and the land. Welcome back to another episode of Regeneration Rising. I'm Taylor Mulia. And before we get started today, I wanted to make some announcements at the top here. There is a lot of cool stuff happening at the New Agrarian Program and at Kibira in general right now. I highly suggest you sign up for our newsletter. You can just find that at kibiracoalition.org. On the upper right-hand corner, there's a button that says Get E-News. Highly suggest it because we have a lot of information to capture in the next couple months. So the first one that I wanted to mention is... If you were not able to secure a spot as an apprentice this season, we are launching a pilot program. It's a little different than what we've ever done before. We are calling it a fellowship. And for folks who can find a job anywhere else, preferably in the Intermountain West, find a job on a ranch or a farm that has livestock, we're trying to put together some programming to bring you on as more of a fellow and less of a commitment than an apprenticeship, but you still get the benefits of being an apprentice, like educational programming and in-person opportunities. And so we're still putting together information about that, but I highly recommend keeping an eye on our newsletter for updates because um, very exciting program that we're going to launch this year, and we should be able to take a handful of people to try out this pilot. In other news, we are looking for case study participants. If you know of a large acreage livestock operation in the Intermountain West that has helped a new agrarian without their own land access or infrastructure to start their own business within the Mentor's core ranching operation, we are looking to develop a toolkit guide on this topic and offer a stipend to reimburse participants for their time speaking with us. So an example of this would be a cow-calf operation allowing their apprentice or employee to start a stalker operation under the umbrella of the main ranch, or maybe allowing them to run their own sheep enterprise on certain weedy pastures to kind of get them started. And it serves as a little bit of an incubator opportunity. We are looking for case studies so that we can put together a guide for other people to maybe replicate those really unique and creative ideas. So if you know anyone who might be a good fit, or if you or yourself are involved in something like that, you can contact Luca, who is on our new agrarian program team. Her email address is luka at kiveracoalition.org. So with that, I will introduce our guest today. Terrence is the owner of Wild Boyd Farm in Matheson, Colorado. We have a great conversation about kind of getting started, what it takes to sort of grow from the ground up and how to secure land. And we also have a really good conversation about moving to a rural place. I think a lot of our apprentices are facing that challenge and maybe that worry before moving to a new community. And Terrence has some tips. So thank you so much to Terrence for joining us today. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy. Terrence, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So uh, can you tell us first where you're calling in from today? Uh, I'm calling in from Matheson, Colorado. Um, we're about 20 miles west of Lyman, and we sit off of Highway 24. Right on. So for folks that aren't in Colorado, um, you're on the Eastern Plains, correct? Uh, yeah, like Southeastern. So Terrence, uh, I would love to hear a little bit more about your background. So where did you grow up? What, what were you like growing up? And what were you interested in? Uh, well, I grew up in Denver um the city and i was adventurous just like any other young boy um always into something always wanting to be outside 
So a lot of my childhood was spent outside doing what boys do, um, football, soccer, you know, any kind of sports. Bicycles were in at that point in time with the pegs and everything. So building tree houses, you know, whatever whatever we could get into outside is pretty much what, what I was doing. <laughs> nice. I don't know if it's like this in Arizona, but my brother used to find the dirt lots that were not um, developed yet into housing developments and build jumps, jump with your bicycle and <laughs> be out yep. there digging all day. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. That was me. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yep. I'm, I'm very familiar. So um, I would love to sort of dive into your farming journey. So you, you started sort of backwards from a lot of folks. So you started actually with home ownership and then you had a deep interest in economics. And then, so I kind of want to start with first, like, I think buying a home is quite an accomplishment for, you know, a young person nowadays. How did you go about buying a home? And like, how did you get to the point where you could? My interest in economics is kind of what pushed my wife and I to home ownership. And also the fact that I graduated high school in 2008. And so when I was introduced to the real world, so to speak, we never had it easy economic downturn during the time we were graduating, jobs were at an all-time low. And so it really molded me or forced me to become creative in in my survival here. So home ownership was always important um, in my family. So yeah, tell us about the, the property that you purchased. Uh, how much land was that original sort of piece of land? So the original um, property that we own today was started out at, I think, three acres. So that was enough for us to, coming from the city, obviously three acres is a nice distance in between my neighbors and I. So with that, I should say that Wild Boyd Farm transitioned from a homestead into a farm. We didn't come to Matheson to like farm for other people, right? And and so in my economic background, I knew that there would be a point in time, given the current situation, that we would need to produce for ourselves, whether that's to hedge inflation, whether that's to secure food. But I think at any point in time, any person should look at their current situation and see what can we provide for ourselves, right? A big part to this green energy and global warming is our reliance on mass production. So if I can produce for myself, I now take away a lot of things that I would contribute to in global warming, such as food production, right? I'm not traveling to the grocery store every week to have food. I get to control the food that I produce. So I'm not contributing to like pesticides, herbicides, things like that, which in some cases you have to use on a mass production scale. And so I think all that tied in right to the economic background that I have in saying, okay, if the economy is doing this, this seems like the safest route to go, which in all totality is the only way to go. If you really break it down, you should be here to produce for yourself. At the end of the day, you know, it may sound harsh or, or, not the way I want to say it, but that's what it boils down to. You should produce for yourself because no, there's nothing here that says they have to feed you, mm-hmm. right? And so it, when you look at it, the best way I think to go about it is you should take an interest in in life's everyday necessities or living. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I like that quote. You should take an interest. Yeah, I truly think a lot of people go their entire lives without 
taking an interest in where their clothes come from or their soap or their or food or their devices. It's, it's, it's all coming from somewhere. And I think it can be really easy to go your entire life nowadays without even thinking about it, but it's not that different. I mean, a, a hundred years ago, we were in a very different place. So it's, it's pretty crazy that disconnect has become so quick. Yes. Yes. And that's, and that's what happens when you leave the necessities of life to other people. It sounds like it's really important to you, sort of like food sovereignty and and understanding and like having that direct line to where your food comes from. So I would love to hear more about how did you how did you learn how to do this? Like, did you kind of just jump in? Did what resources did you? Yeah, I would love to hear about through the early days of this project. It resorts back to um, my economic background, and I'm a very dry reader. Like I can read the Federalist Papers, no problem. <laughs> you know, I, should also, no problem. I should also ask you, Terrence. Like, but tell us more about your degree. Like, did you spend a lot of time sort of reading this stuff on your own, or did you was it mostly through school? So the university, I did not graduate. Mm. I did not finish college because I had used college as a tool to get what I needed. The university I was attending did not have an economics degree. Right. So I had to take cybersecurity, mm. which was my second interest. And while I was in school, I was in the library mm. reading, you know, and then I stumbled apro- across a lot of economic books, which I intended to do. I blew the dust off of those. And I mean, <laughs> I would come home, you know, with books piled to the ceiling of economists and very dry, dry stuff that most (laughs) people obviously did not read because there are plenty of dust on those books. But, you know, that's how I started understanding how the world functions. I think you have to understand how, or at least have an idea of how the world functions to give you a start on maybe what you want to pursue regardless what that is. And that will help you narrow down what makes sense and what does not make sense. I started coming across podcasts, Joel Salatin, Greg Judy, but primarily I would say a lot of Joel Salatin. And so I had headphones and I had the ability that a lot of people don't have to listen to two, three, four hour podcast or listen to audio books. Most people don't have that luxury because I consider it a luxury while you're working. Mm. And so, you know, I would send them to my wife. I know my wife didn't have enough time to listen Mm -hmm. to. She kind of just let me form this together. Mm -hmm. And And I should point that out, you know, that the success so far of Wild Boy Farm is because of the ability of my wife, my partner, to lead and support me. It's going to be very difficult to build anything if you don't have the support of a partner. Mm. And so I have a lot of people who ask me, well, you know, how do I go about this? And, you know, I say, if your partner is not willing to do it, or to support you, then I don't think it's feasible or wise to go into this industry because I've seen farms be torn apart through, you know, partnerships. So that's just something I wanted to point out kind of at that, at this point is that, you know, my wife's ability to support me and this family and this farm is what has made the impact it's important to to just kind of be be clear about like yeah that this is not something that you can just sort of like quit your job and go do like i think there's a lot of other industries that you might be able to do that but i think with farming yeah you're you're so right it's like having that support financially having that support at home too just even like to bounce ideas off of and you guys have a family too you have children and so Correct. this is Correct. yeah so this is something that you really need to sort of work together on it's critical to have that support 
Right, right. And we both worked to build the homestead until, you know, it got to a certain point in which the homestead became Wild Boyd Farm. And at that point in time, there was still, right? And also there's tough decisions that you have to to make. When you're first starting out, okay, you got the house and some land, you know, typically if you're not purchasing a farm, if you're building a homestead or a farm, now you have to put in the infrastructure. And so my wife was out there with me holding T-posts Why I put T-posts into the ground. Both of us after working nine, 10 hours a day, and okay. that's after feeding the kids, helping the kids with the homework. And so it's extremely expensive to start out. I mean, it was expensive when we started out. And now, you know, when I go purchase some T-posts or something, they're even two or three times more expensive than right. um, what we started with. So I think, you know, that's incredibly difficult to manage if you're starting out. Yeah. And when you first started, what was your first, like, uh, I think we talked about you did broiler chickens and sounds like you had some laying hens and some pigs. How did you um, go about buying your first stock and like doing the very first batches of chickens? Uh, So our first ever livestock that we purchased were actually Hampshire pigs. There was three of them and we just found them on Craigslist. Someone was selling some piglets. And we said, okay, let's let's do it. Because, you know, you really don't know what kind of infrastructure you need until you have livestock. So we had gotten kind of the beginning part of our perimeter fence in. We didn't have paddocks then. And so we found three pigs, a boar and, and two gilts. And, and we picked them up in my wife's Jeep. Um <laughs> <laughs> And we didn't have any, no kennels, <laughs> no, no nothing. So they were you just, just put them in the jeep. <laughs> yep, just put them, just put them in the jeep. You know, um, oh like God. I said, you know, we we started from scratch. Like when I say scratch, it was scratch. We we didn't even have shelters for the pigs just quite yet. None of that. And so after we got them back, we had this chain link fence area. So I said, okay, well, they can just kind of hang out in the chain link fence area. And so from there, we moved into constructing a pig shelter, a hog shelter, and got that done with a tarp and and some wood and got them going. Same with hog feed. And we didn't know anything about hog feeders or or anything. So we had the rubber bowls that you typically would get from a supply store and we were feeding them in that. And then we realized that didn't work. And so I think the beauty of starting from scratch is you truly get to see what works and what doesn't work. And the bowls did not work for long. They were knocking those bowls over and costing us more in fees. Yeah, which would become important at any point in time, whether you're homesteading or production for others. So then we we moved into hands after we had gotten our pigs and getting the infrastructure in for those. And so I think being a multi-species kind of grazing operation, we just kind of took the bull by the horns and said, okay, well, let's figure out what it takes to to house and raise and, and produce pigs. Let's move the chickens. Let's see for hens what it takes. And, and then, you know, lamb and goat, and then finally cattle. And so as we moved through those different livestock, we were able to build the infrastructure for each livestock that we had at that point in time. So yeah, Terrence, we talked earlier about how you had sort of developed a relationship with a mentor, another rancher down the road, and and he helped you kind of get into the cattle industry because 
um, you're talking about in- infrastructure and we're talking about getting into raising cattle, just the infrastructure needs kind of explode. And so, yeah, I'm curious to hear how that developed. Like what's your relationship like and how's that been for you? Uh, so that, that relationship happened organically. We started, like I said, homesteading. And so we stay close to the post office here in town. And so as he would come and check his mail, he would see that I was obviously trying to do something. And so he would just kind of stop. And like I said, with the pigs, he was like, well, what's your plan with those pigs? You know, and and I said, well, we're going to eat them. And he said, well, I wouldn't eat the boar because obviously it's a male intact pig and it can almost have like a must taste to it, you know, so just kind of just things like that. When we first bought the property and moved in, he came down, him and his wife and introduced themselves. So that's kind of how it got going. And then I decided one day, I say, we've done pigs, we've done chicken, we've done sheep and goat. I think I want to go into the cattle industry. So I went down there. He was down in the shop and I said, I like to buy some cows. He said, well, why don't you come out? We'll be branding and sorting and stuff like that. I didn't know what I was getting into, but he said breakfast started at eight. And so my wife and I and kids, we showed up at eight that day and had breakfast and went out and started branding and cutting and, you know, doing all the things that are a part of raising cattle. I think the universe has a funny way of, if it's meant to be introducing you into something, right? Like to have a mentor to say, well, come on this day. If you truly want to, right, it's not just you throw some cows in, in a pasture and whatnot. So I think the universe for the mentors that I've had throughout my farming journey to to say, if you truly want to do this, right, if you want to raise cattle, let's put you in there and see. You know, I never ran the cow. I never roped the cow. I never flipped a, a steer on its side. You know, I've never cut bulls to turn them into steers. You know, none of that. And mm-hmm. so what a blessing for him to say, if you want to do this, let's see. If you're going to cowboy up, let's see and throw you out there before you even go and purchase cattle. You know, like I could have probably went to a different ranch and said, hey, I want to buy cattle because I've seen that happen to people who have come to me afterwards for advice. And they're like, they'll sell you cattle because that's what you asked for. Mm -hmm. But he's seen in me something more Mm -hmm. and said, okay, you want to understand it. We're going to start you out here. And then I didn't get my, you know, I picked out my two heifers at that point in time. And I didn't get those until I got the fence done. He's like, well, you know, I'll sell them to you, but you got to get your fence done. You know, not just giving, just dropping you off cows. I think, you know, that's very important. And I see, see it all the time. People get livestock and it doesn't work out because it's more than just having them, right? Your husbandry skills. Are you willing to go the extra mile? You know, I'm feeding regardless if I'm sick. They didn't ask to be here, Mm -hmm. right? I put them here. And so it's my duty to make sure that they're taken care of every single day. And there's so many times that I see folks get into homesteading and they move from the city and they have these animals and they're like wanting to show people that they have the livestock, but they also want to go on vacation. They they want to go boating. They want to go here and there and there and so on. And that does not mean anything to the livestock that you're taking care of. And it's just not a good scenario. So I would say that if this is something you want to do, it's not just for looks. Mm. Right. It's something that you have to be willing to, or like you mentioned, 
before we kind of got going, you having to do what you had to do to get water to the livestock. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to do that? You know, Mm -hmm. that's the true question in the freezing cold and having to break tanks, having, you know, all this stuff. Are you willing to do at any point in time in the day? Mm -hmm. On any given day. Yeah. Even when it's, (laughs) yeah, when it's much cozier inside and (laughs) right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So what is that mentor's name that sort of took you into the branding and, and kind of showed you the ropes? Uh, Cliff Stice. Cliff. Okay. Right on. And so, so then you guys transitioned into, yeah, having a more dynamic, more of a farm operation instead of just a small homestead. So talk a little bit more about like, what does the farm look like today? Um, and, and where, where do you see it going? It's important to point out that, right, I did not turn this into a farm. The public turned it into a farm, right? I didn't, like I said, I didn't come out here to produce like I'm producing now for other folks. And so it transitioned into production for others because we did not know when we produced how much production something yielded. Mm. So we had extra and we gave that extra out. And then those consumers then came back and said, hey, can we have some more? Can we buy Mm -hmm. some? And that's how that turned in organically into Wild Boy Farm today, which we now service seven nonprofits, one chain of hotels. Well, I think we're at six schools. Wow. And, you know, everyday consumers and I think one or two restaurants. So. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. And, you know, you guys have a production for yourselves, but you're also partnering with some other farmers and ranchers that you trust and you really admire their practices and you sort of bring together a lot of products from from the region, correct? Correct, correct. So, you know, Wild Boy Farms team allows its expansion. I think ever so often we don't think about how much a yield is from a particular animal and how many people that can feed. And and so once you understand that, then you can understand the partnerships and why we partner. And then secondly, there's this game with the bank. If you're trying to buy land, uh, it's kind of like what came first, the chicken or the egg? So in the journey for Wild Boy Farm, we've talked to numerous different farm banks and everything, right? And the goal was you need more land, you need more land. We understand, I understand, the family understands what's coming to us down the pipeline. And we need to, let's say, earn more money to be able to qualify for more land. And so I think... The ability to grow the farm without growing the farm is essential to any beginning farmer or rancher in today's time. And if you can do that, I think you can be very successful. Yeah. So you're saying you had to show income, but you can't show more income unless you get more land. But the point, like you wanted to show income to to acquire more land, but you needed land to, to generate the income. And so that's the problem. So I, so I'm, I'm understanding that you're partnering with other folks to be like, okay, let's get some product through here and start selling and making some income. And then maybe we can start to organically like that income will show the bank like, okay, cool. Now we'll get bigger and bigger. And is it your goal to buy more land? Or are you looking at leasing? Or are you looking at just making a sort of being a like meat, like a food hub kind of thing? Like what's, what are your goals for the next, yeah, the next part of this journey? I think just exploring the limitations and seeing, I guess, how big can it get because before it becomes too big? Right. And we lease, we lease, you know, thousands of acres on top of partnering with other ranchers. When we started, we started at a weird time for seasoned ranchers. It was during the drought. 
a lot of ranchers were struggling to maintain their cows. And so I was able to give them kind of a price that they were accustomed to for their livestock. And we did various things, whether we bought them as calves, whether we bought them as yearlings and finished them off and and just kind of played around with that until we found a sweet spot. And believe it or not, a lot of ranchers are older and they don't have to do what what we're doing because they don't need to. And so if you once you understand that, then you see, OK, well, it's no different than me almost being like a sale barn, but purchasing from ranchers that I know have this, the practices that that we do whether they're American grass-fed associated, you know, all those different things. And those are the things that we looked at. And a lot of it was just partnerships, just guys and gals that I met throughout my journey that were just like, hey, we have some extra here. Would you like them? Like, yeah, sure. I can, I can find a place for them direct to the consumer that they cannot. Mm -hmm. or that they don't care for, Mm -hmm. right? And so I think that's another way to to go about it. I know Joel Salatin kind of talked about acquiring farms and and lease land, you know, is one way to grow your farm. But there's not enough lease land. And lease land is built off of relationships. It's not just you show up and say, hey, I want to lease your land. Like, no, those, those take time. And so the ability for Wild Boy Farm to grow steadily and build solid relationships, we didn't start off leasing land. It took us, you know, two, three years to acquire our first lease land. At this point, it's a lot of direct market beef, correct? Like when you were saying hotels and, and all these different nonprofits and stuff like that, are you still producing pork and chicken or is it like, what what are the products that you offer right now? Uh, we still offer it all in, and we have a market for all, whether it's chicken, goat, lamb, beef. So we, we have a market for it all, everything except eggs. Mm-hmm. I don't do eggs. <laughs> Why not eggs? <laughs> I mean, we, we produce eggs for ourselves, but it's just, I think you have to find the point of, is it cost effective to do eggs? And and I think there, because of the shortage of eggs during that time, I've seen an explosion of producers being able to get their eggs into grocery stores and into the hands of people and in eggs I've always felt is something you can do on your own as a business I don't find it cost effective to yeah raise eggs on a mass level like that yeah yeah no I totally agree I had the same experience we just couldn't make them we would have to have achieved a scale that I don't think I was ready for or ever really want to do um I was like, yeah, I mean, we could do it, but do I love producing eggs? I think that's a huge question is like, yeah, is it worth it? And I think it sounds like you have interest in other meats. So it's like, you don't really need to complicate it more than that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we were approached for eggs a pretty good amount. I think they were wanting like 40, 50 dozen a week. And and so you do the math, right? I'm an economics guy, so I do the math. I break it all down and I'm like, okay, I would need approximately 400 and something hens to make that happen. Okay. Now, how are you going, what, what are you going to do with the manure? What are you going to do about feed? And do you really want 400 hens in, in, in is the gain of the 400 hens for the 20 or 40 dozen eggs, whatever it is a week. Mm -hmm. Is that greater than what you can do? on that same amount of land with a different livestock. Yeah. Yeah. And I think labor has to get labor and infrastructure have to get factored into those too. So. Yeah. yeah. That's something that is extremely difficult to do is to factor in, right. I can't 
how do I factor in labor into your product? You can't. Yeah. You just, you can't, you know, because, at, and, you know, we're always asked, do you have employees? No, we have family employees, but we don't have like a group of employees that I went out and hired. Because, see, when you start factoring in wage, your pro so, so when you start out selling direct to consumer, there's the true cost of food. Most people don't know the true cost of food. You and I know, and any rancher or any producer knows the true cost of food. Mm -hmm. And the true cost of food includes labor. Now, can you charge for labor? Can you charge for infrastructure? Right? You know, how, how long will it take for it to pay off the infrastructure alone? Yeah. Yeah, that's such a huge struggle. It's like to ever get to that point where you could actually have an employee. Yeah, I know we in our small farm operation, we were never anywhere close to hiring an employee. It was always like, oh my gosh, no, I'm not even factoring my own labor in. <laughs> it's kind of laughable. And so I got I got sort of stuck in that in that equation too, and I couldn't quite figure that out. But um, but I think what you can do is figure out enterprises that are a little bit less labor intensive. And I think poultry is one of those that's just super high. You're, you got to move 400 birds, you're moving, you got to hook up a tractor and move those chicken coops. Like every day, you got to be on it, all the fencing, all the feed, all the water. <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, I totally understand that decision. Yeah. And so, so there's the true cost of, of food. And, and you can't, go into the consumer market because the consumer market does not understand the true cost of food. They're trying to figure out why chicken thighs are a dollar ninety nine when they were eighty nine cents two weeks ago. Yeah. And you as a rancher, a poultry producer is saying, Well how how the hell are are they sell, selling chicken thighs at a dollar ninety nine a pound and oh. and function, you know? It yep. just does it. Those are two different genres yep. of agriculture. And I yep. think obviously the genre of mass produced food has kind of came and it stayed and it made sense to to people at the time, but they did not understand the long term effects of commercial agriculture like that mm -hmm. um, and so now our generation is saying okay well why is our life expectancy 70 when my mentor's 83 and climbing over corral panels you know um, <laughs> you know uh why is the average age of someone in matheson who passes 90 years old why is that you know and so you know, the science is coming in and we're saying, OK, well, we think food is a contributing factor of that. And so how do we get back to the grassroots of agriculture without mass agriculture? Right. right. Or a large, you know, corporation farming, I should say. And, Absolutely. and so there's this culture, there's this price shock. OK, twenty five dollars for a whole bird that we'll just take that for instance $25 is what we charge for our pastor chicken that's a whole bird if we could get them to four pounds they more or less are like three and a half pounds so if you break that down to per pound that's what like seven dollars a pound or so seven and some change but the consumer is like well seven dollars a pound I'm paying two dollars a pound but if you purchase from a rancher everything changes right? They don't take the chlorine bath. Mm -hmm. They're not pumped. They're not, they're steroid free. In most cases, if you're doing it, maybe like a Joel Salatin method, like we do, these are the health benefits, but then here comes the recession. And now the consumer's forced to say, well, I really should probably eat that, but my wallet book does not say that. And so I think for the consumer, they really have to start looking at food as a necessity, right? Not a luxury like it is. It 
you know, it needs to get worked into just your basic needs and in, in, not just food, but good food. Right, right. And and when you do that, then you get the benefits of everything that comes along with it. And I think Wild Boy Farms' ability to find ways to get healthy food into consumers' hands without costing the consumer much is a big, big key. Yep. And Terrence, I want to go back to to like, I am super curious about your experience coming from the city and transitioning into agriculture and then kind of being swept into a very big thing. Like you're now running a farm and you kind of signed up to do a homestead. You found like, oh my gosh, there's so much demand. So now we're, I guess we're running a farm now. (laughs) And so you sort of uh, weaved yourself into the community in Matheson. Um, Tell me what that community is like. How are you accepted as being someone that was, you know, not from there? How has that process been for you? Oh, well, just like any other small town, it's incredibly difficult to get into, right? Because a lot of things are passed down or they're held onto and rented out. So to be an owner in a small town, I think is a blessing in itself. I love the Matheson community. You know, you have to have morals and values and things that align when you move into any community. I think far so often a lot of people who grow up in the city, they grow up in neighborhoods and neighborhoods do not function like communities. And if you don't understand how a community functions, then you should do your research before you move into any community. And I think a lot of people who may have certain values political, whatever, it does not matter. You're not going to change the community. You're just not. You, if you kind of get what I'm saying, you you yourself and you're, you're talking about families that have been here for hundreds of years, mm-hmm. hundreds of years, and you think you're going to come in and change an entire community because your values that you brought from the city are different and you don't believe how that community functions, well, then leave the community. Mm. Mm. Um, I think my political views align with my community, right? So I didn't have a hard time living in rural America. My family does not have a hard time because our political views, our values, our morals line up with the community in the county. It was a smooth transition for us for the most part. But uh, I think for most people in rural America, if they can see you hard work, right? Hard work, dedication, and a whole lot of try. And so I had those characteristics, right? You could drive by and it'd be freezing cold and I'm out there getting a the fence ready. It just shows them you're getting the job done. Your dedication right? Your husbandry skills in the cold, just like Cliff is, right? Your things just kind of align. And so, you know, you just have to have values, morals, because rural America, that's how it survived Mm -hmm. for so long is, is values. Your word is everything. And if, if you break your word, nothing else matters. But your word, if you're going to do something, do it. If you're not going to do it, just say you're not going to do it. Don't procrastinate or play this game like you can do in the city because you may never see that person again. Out here, you're going to see that person, whether it's at the, the high school football game, basketball game, the graduation, you know, the butcher shop, the feed store. It, it just so it holds you accountable. And if you're not willing to rise to that occasion, then rural America is not for you. And I think there's lots of instances where you can sort of, you can find a community that aligns with your values. And it's not necessarily like rural America is one thing, but I think there are, there are pockets where it's like, maybe I will fit over here. Maybe I did not fit over there. And it's not, it's not like you can't belong at all. It's just like, it happened to be that math doesn't fit pretty well with, with your ideals. And it, it kind of was a good fit for you. Right, right, right. 
yeah, I kind of want to hit on too, like the social aspect of, of farming. And I know that you told me a story when we were talking before that you had linked up with the Department of Ag and you were looking through the sort of like registry of, of farm and ranch owners in Colorado and came to the conclusion that you are the only, if not one of the only black men, black people to own a farm or ranch in Colorado. And I don't have the data to like, I don't know that there's official data for that anywhere. I don't know if if the Department of Ag is capturing all of it, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem too far off um, just based on historical inequities. How did that make you feel to, to learn that? Well, I think the right way to say it is Wild Boyd Farm is an African-American farm ranch, and it's one of the only ranches, Black-owned ranches, that operate here in the state of Colorado. I think that's the best way to put it, because there are farms, per se, here that are owned by Mm African-Americans, right? I think there's two or three i mean it's not like there's right a ton of us it's still, <laughs> still so, i know like we're talking about a handful of people so like yeah i mean yeah. how does that make you feel how does that like how does that sit with you you know when we found out it didn't change anything for me you know because it doesn't your color of the skin does not matter to me i think it what it showed was the land inequity for african americans here in the state and that, right, you can do it. There is a way. You know, I didn't grow up as a cowboy. You know, I wanted to be one, but I couldn't, you know, I was a cowboy in other ways, maybe how I carried myself, and but I wasn't out here roping, you know, or, or riding, you know, none of the stuff that I do today. But I think it, the importance of Wild Boy Farm for young men like me or women like me who want to see for their own eyes and maybe have the opportunity to come out right because not uh, not every farm or ranch is just open to the public right it's not like i can just drive down the driveway and say hey give me a tour you know <laughs> i think some a lot of people think that's true and i've learned that over the years that i think that's a great public service announcement <laughs> yeah yeah, that, that's not how it works because no. that is private property and they may not be operational. And so, but then for people who maybe look like me or come from a background like me, how are you even going to find one to say, hey, let's see, you know, or how many of these farms or ranches are reaching out to the community? Like, yes, I live in a community, but my outreach is not in Matheson, believe it or not. Wild Board Farm does not sell a whole lot of stuff in Elbert County. I don't even attempt to sell anything in Elbert County because it's not needed in Elbert County. It's needed in Denver. It's needed in Aurora. It's needed in parts of Adams, Jeff Coe. You know, Thornton, North Glen, places like that is where your greatest impact is. So it it creates this like huge gap between people who want to get involved in agriculture and people who have a lot of knowledge and infrastructure to get started. So, yeah, it's um, it's really interesting how you've you've kind of bridged that gap um, and and made your way in. But it sounds like you have a lot of a lot of overlapping principles and ideals of your community. So you you um, serve a really interesting role there, kind of like bridging that rural urban divide. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, something that the commissioner had told me years ago. And it's something that I knew. One reason I don't believe in charging in delivery is because I want you to experience my product, right? The consumer can go to the grocery store right now. That's convenient to them. That's been molded. See, how how are you going to, as a farmer or rancher, if I'm 30, I'm 33 years old, for 28 years of my life, all I did was go to a grocery store, right? I That's all I knew, right? I watched my mama, my grandma, 
and they just go to the grocery store. And so you inherit that trait to go to a grocery store. And so how can you break that mold as a farmer or a rancher for your consumers? You're going to have to sacrifice something, whether it's your delivery charge and it's 95 miles from from my gate to your, to to Denver. You know, and we make that journey at least twice a week for deliveries. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And I don't once once I get in the metro area, right, everything's kind of fairly close, you know, five miles, 10 miles. So I, I say, OK, well, we want our consumers to have this product It's my duty to get it in to their hand. Right. That's how this works. So I can't charge you for that. Like I can't because you're already paying a little more. You're already paying the true cost of food now and now you got to charge for delivery yeah that's tough yeah that's tough it's kind of making them pay the price twice pretty much right for something that you want them to have Mm -hmm. right if you were just homesteading you know but now you're a farm business you know the whole thing changes Mm -hmm. the whole picture changes and it's more customer service based now Mm mm-hmm and have you have you enjoyed sort of assuming more of a business person businessman role in the in this farm or have you sort of like where do your interests lie at this point do you kind of um are you enjoy because you have an economics background so it sounds like it's something that has come natural to you but are you sort of enjoying that growth or are you kind of like oh no i feel like i need to get back to the farm part or yeah or you know you have a job do you still have an off farm job No, no. Okay. Um, Okay. So you're not balancing that good. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, I was able to, you know, it came to a turning point in which, you know, you have to decide, are you going to spread your wings and fly or continue to indulge in the comfort that you do have? And, you know, I decided to let them spread and fly. So I've been fortunate to now take the time that I would not have as much of to now invest into the farm business to to grow the business. And I do, I love every aspect of it from the time a calf or, you know, a lamb or a kid hits the ground till the time we take it to harvest till the time we pick it up from harvest and deliver it to the consumer. You know, I get to see every minute of that livestock's life almost. You're taking care of them every day, so you see them every day. You take them to harvest, and then you pick them up from harvest, and then I'm doing the final mile, you know, the delivery direct to customer. Now, I will say I do miss the farm when I get into the city. (laughs) (laughs) I will say that. So I'm definitely rushing back. But I think being able to be a part of every aspect of it is is a blessing in itself. Okay, so one last question for you. I know you've dropped a lot of nuggets of wisdom for our listeners. But is there any sort of one piece of advice that you would give to a young person starting in agriculture today? I will say this, two things. Don't do it if you're not committed, and it's a commitment above everything else. You have to commit to your livestock. And secondly, one of the largest costs for a ranch or a farm is the amount of money that it borrows, right? The biggest cost of a farm could be the money that it borrows if you don't understand this. And so don't get into, I see all too often, people starting out, they go out and finance this brand new John Deere or Kubota to then move hay around that they have to spend money on, right? Uh, And then you got to put fuel in it, which now you probably need fuel on your property. And so everything that goes into to it you have to think, is it worth it just because you can have it? 
we don't own no tractors mm-hmm. still to this day. And I, and I could have bought a tractor three times over, but I don't need it. I guess the, the piece of advice there is sort of find the bare minimum that you can get away with comfortably and, and don't take for granted how um, costly borrowing money can be. I think it's, yeah, it, even if it's possible and they'll give you a payment that you can handle, it, it, it still is not necessarily a wise decision to, to take on debt for the farm operation, especially for something that you don't 100% need, but maybe in your mind you think you need because that's what everybody else has, but may, perhaps you could make do without it. Yeah, you know, my mentor told me when we were driving around checking for cows, I said, Cliff, how much you think that shop? He said, well, wait a minute. That shop is a luxury for me. It's not a luxury for anyone else but me. This skidster is a luxury for me because mm-hmm. you can take hay and walk it out there. <laughs> you can pull a wagon or, you know, you can get a horse. You know, there's there's other ways, but these are luxuries for you. A shop. Mm-hmm is a luxury for you a skidster is a luxury for you those little john deere um, gators or polaris rangers those are luxuries for you because you can always walk well that's a great piece of advice is to kind of start small and don't get don't get too far over your head because yeah it can be very tempting with all the goodies that people (laughs) sell especially right there at the feed store when you're like ah when you're vulnerable (laughs) yeah yeah and and it's never ending and every time you every everything that i've noticed anytime you add something it's more or less adding something else so it's like a double add if you buy like i said a tractor now you gotta service the tractor You got to have a truck large enough to pull that tractor. You got to have a trailer large enough to to load that tractor on. Yeah, it's so much more than just that tractor. (laughs) It's just not, you know, um, okay, I got the tractor. I mean, I've met people who have had the tractor delivered, you know, straight from Kubota. But how are you going to get it back to Kubota? you know, to have a service. Oh, well, they could come out here and serve. Yeah, now that's the next, you know, and it just adds up over time and, and it's a luxury. So really think if that luxury is is needed. Yeah, especially just when you're starting out. Absolutely. Well, awesome. Well, Terrence, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate uh, our conversation and thanks for sharing your wisdom with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you'd like to connect to the broader Kivir community of ranchers, farmers, conservation and government agency professionals, educators, nature nerds, curious consumers, and more, we're excited to have you. Our website is kiviracoalition.org, and in the upper right, click on Get E-News to sign up for our newsletter, where we share happenings and events, learning opportunities, job postings, and more. Also, if you're enjoying this podcast, please leave us a review and a rating. It really will help other people find us and maybe even find their next step in regenerative agriculture. Thanks so much and see you next time. Thank you for listening to Regeneration Rising, a podcast production of the Kavira Coalition. Find us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and other popular podcast platforms. Become a Patreon supporter by visiting kaviracoalition.org slash podcasts. We'd like to thank Kavira staff for their contributions to this podcast. This episode was edited and engineered by Caleb Wenzel Fisher. Wanderlust, our theme music, was made by Scott Buckley. And we're grateful for our guests taking the time to talk with us about their experiences. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the land. Music